At this time, I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Robert Kushner, who is the Professor of Medicine and Medi Medicine Education at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and the Director uh, for the Center of Life Medicine in Chicago. After finishing his residency in internal medicine at Northwestern University, he went on to complete a postgraduate fellowship in clinical nutrition and earned a master's degree in clinical nutrition and nutritional biology from the University of Chicago. Dr. Kushner has been the past president of many organizations, uh, such as TOS, the American Society per for Periential and Enteral Nutrition, the American Board of Physician Nutrition Specialists, and the founder and past chair of the American Board of Obesity Medicine. He was awarded the 2016 Clinician of the Year Award by the Obesity Society, and Dr. Kushner has published over 250 articles, reviews, books, books chapter, and books, book chapters covering medical nutrition, medical nutrition education, obesity, and is an international expert on the care of, a, of patients who are affected by obesity. His most recent book is Six Factors to Fit, Weight Loss That Works for You. Dr. Kushner's research include, interests include medical and obesity education and lifestyle and pharmacological approaches to obesity. Please welcome Dr. Kushner. Can you bring up the next slide? The uh, keypad is not working now. There we go. And it should come on there. There you go. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. Uh, nature, a hard act to follow, I have to tell you. Uh, all well-deserving from what I've heard. And so wonderful that your family was here to... To, uh, to hear that, um, which is a wonderful gift to you. Uh, now you have to hear me. So, <laughs> um, I was so pleased to receive this invitation to speak on um, interdisciplinary and, mul and uh, multimodality care. Uh, I've embraced that for my entire life um, and have practiced uh, interdisciplinary and multimodality care. I've been on the non-bariatric surgical side of that. Um, but in order to speak about those broad topics, I think it's easier to focus on one topic to really understand what that actually means. And for me as a non-surgeon, but as a obesity medicine physician, uh, the role of using interdisciplinary and multimodality, multimodality care uh, I think is most pronounced when we deal with the problem of post-bariatric uh, surgery recurrence. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be focusing in on. Uh, these are my disclosures. So this is the outline for my talk. I'll first address interdisciplinary care, uh, then shift to the problem of weight recurrence, uh, psychotherapeutic and behavioral treatment, and then dive down much deeper into the role of pharmacotherapy and that's where we're going to really talk about multimodality uh, care. So this is not new, at least the first part of the theme, and that is interdisciplinary care. You're all familiar with this. It goes back to the original statement in 1991, and I put in bold the key passages, uh, multi, uh, uh, inter multidisciplinary team with access to medical, surgical, psychiatric, and nutritional expertise. And of course, your whole integrated care group uh, is really founded on that. And um, so that's not new. Uh, and also the team working in a clinical setting with adequate support from all aspects of perioperative management and assessment. And that has continued to be embraced. So I don't think this is new to any of us. And just by the nature of giving a presentation to this group, uh, we all identify with this. This is a slide I've used from the beginning of my practice that goes back quite some time, showing this Venn diagram between inpatient and outpatient care with all of the providers around the uh, outside uh, really working together. There are some specialties like anesthesia and critical care. It doesn't cross to the outpatient side, um, but some certainly do. Registered nutrition, uh, dietitian nutritionist, the behavioral health provider, uh, surgeon, med obesity medicine specialist, and so forth. So that's not new. 
But what is new, and I'm, I'm so glad that your society really has, is focusing on the second theme, which is multimodality care, is how do we actually put of all this, how do we put all this together? This is a treatment paradigm that folks like myself use all the time that run comprehensive obesity care centers. Um, and we've embraced this pyramid uh, theme. I like it because the foundation of the treatment pyramid is lifestyle modification. So it's foundational, and it's also the largest part of the pyramid because it incorporates the greatest number of patients, and that is, frankly, everyone who suffers from obesity or deals with obesity would benefit from guidance on self-management when it comes to diet, physical activity, behavioral modification, sleep hygiene, stress management, social interactions, and so forth. And then you guys live on the top, uh, which is surgery. Uh, it's the top of the pyramid because it's the most aggressive treatment. It's surgical, and it actually is a smaller m number of patients who qualify or need or accept having bariatric surgery. What's been left out, of course, is the middle section modality, which is medication. Uh, and what I will be telling you um, during this talk is we are truly at an inflection point regarding the efficacy of medication, and it's so timely uh, that um, not only are some of the pharmaceutical companies advertising heavily in your, in your meeting uh, to get you aware of it, uh, but as you will see, the, the potential use of pharmacotherapy in your patients, either with insufficient weight loss, weight regain, or preoperatively really holds promise with the development of these new medications. So this is a patient's weight graph from electronic health record. This is familiar to all of you, but I wanted to kind of frame the discussion by looking at a weight graph. Uh, this is one of my patients uh, who, at the time of operation, her weight was 262 pounds. She natured at 160 pounds and ended up at 198 pounds several years later. So 39% weight loss with a, with a ruinoid gastric bypass. With the weight regain, or weight recurrence, excuse me, she uh, had a 25% weight loss. But what's actually going on here is she regained or had a recurrence of 37% of her weight. And it's that recurrence where I think pharmacotherapy regarding my talk plays a significant role. So let me talk about the problem of weight recurrence. It's not new to you, but let me frame it from my perspective as a non-surgeon. This is data from 2004, quite old, 20 years ago, but I could assure you that if I put all of the lifestyle programs over the past 20 years, it would not change much, probably the shape of this curve. This happens to look at non-surgical weight loss outcomes from behavioral treatments from 1990 to 2000. And they may change a little bit later because now this, the, the programs are longer. We understand obesity is a chronic disease and so forth. But what it shows is that the weight regain over two years from these, uh, pro from these um, programs was 31%. So this is, we see this all the time in lifestyle management. If, and if these individuals were followed up further, the weight recurrence would go up and up. So over five years, you probably regained or had a recurrence of probably 80% rather than 30%. If we look at the surgical literature, you're all familiar with SOS. It's one of the first studies that I think made obesity, um, uh, individuals aware of obesity, uh, surgery uh, in a general sense uh, in the United States as well as globally. And if you look at, although the numbers are small, but if you look at the weight regain or recurrence from those that have gastric bypass, it's 34% from Nader. It's, it's remarkably the same percentage from lifestyle management. And if you look at a larger data population, I believe Dave Arterburn is your keynote speaker tomorrow, uh, and this is his data from Annals of Internal Medicine in 2018, and he had a PCORI grant, which looks at health records of a large population, in this case 44,000, and I just calculated the weight regain or recurrence from surgical uh, gastric sleeve uh, and ruin Y, and it's less than what I said, but it, it's pretty much across the board. Now, I, I want to emphasize, of course, that averages mask uh, individual variability, uh, and I'll get to that point in a minute. So I'm looking at averages now. That doesn't speak that everyone regains weight. I'm looking at population data right now. But it, it, it is not only occurs in lifestyle management, which is where, where I began my career, 
but also has now been seen quite a bit in bariatric surgery, more so than I envisioned when I got involved in this field as a supportive member, uh, and probably more than you thought of, depending on how long ago you got into this field, but it really has become quite significant. And regarding the last data regarding averages, I'm looking at labs two, uh, where the median weight regain in this large uh, observational uh, study uh, was 25% with a range of, 70, of, 20, uh, of 14 to 39% weight regain. So it's pretty well documented. In fact, I tell all my patients now, as you probably do, don't be surprised or I, I set them up for realistic expectations. Although there's heterogeneity of response and so on, on average, people tend to regain weight. And of course, our, our, our field is not based on making you thin or having how much weight you can lose, right? Health, to me, weight is a health metric, um, but it's the regain and the impact on health that we're really paying attention to, and that's shown in the figure towards the right, because associated with the weight regain or weight recurrence is a recurrence of hypertension, diabetes, sleep apnea, and a worsening of quality of life. So that is it, that's what really gets our attention, is that the health quality is being impaired associated with the weight regain or weight recurrence, and that's where the focus is. Now, I, I said momentarily that averages mask individual variability, and this is just one study uh, that I did actually with Tim Cooper for his fourth-year medical school project at Northwestern, and I had him look at our database, so this was his project published um, quite some time ago now, uh, which we looked at only 30, uh, 300 individuals. But the reason I'm showing this is that we used a bar graph to actually look at the cohorts of weight regain rather than averages. And we saw over seven years after gastric bypass, the average weight regain was 23%, very similar to the literature that I've been showing you. But using bar graphs, you can see that nearly half the individuals lost, uh, regained less than 20, uh, 20% of the weight, and, and what brings the average to 23% is that, is that splay uh, going all the way towards the right. So clearly we have to look at individuals, and there's, there's a lot of modeling going on, as you know, to try to anticipate within three to six months what, what trajectory are our patients gonna be on so that we can act so much uh, sooner. Um, equally important, if not more important, is, is what is the What's the patient's experience, right? And we're, we're, we're learning so much now, either through the OAC and so forth, that having a patient's voice is so important rather than just showing data. And this is um, a method that I've used for quite some time now, which is to ask patients to chart their, their weight and life events. And it's like taking a detailed, personalized, autobiographical history uh, of, of someone. And if you look at those types of... of, of um, Patterns, I just pulled, I have so many of these patterns from all my patients after all these years. I just pulled out examples of those that had bariatric surgery just to show you uh, that the, the ebbs and flows and the gains and regains of weight from surgery really aren't that much different from my interventions. Here you see someone, this is themselves, they talked about the life events in their weight. So it says they were single, they lost weight, they developed pregnancy, they gained weight, they had divorced, they gained and lost weight probably. Uh, and then you see weight loss surgery is really kind of within there, followed by weight regain again. And it's all these life events that have an effect. Here's another one who hit peak weight, had gastric bypass, only to go on to have other life events, child number one, child number two. So if you talk about why do patients experience weight recurrence, in part, if you ask them, it's not my metabolism so much as having adaptation and my pouch is bigger. It's these life events that they are experiencing. And here's just two more. Someone had bariatric surgery, then they end up retiring, and they caused weight regain. And patient number four who had, um, who had lap surgery uh, and then regaining weight again. So hearing their stories or having them graph it is so important. More recently, a qualitative project uh, was published looking at thematic analysis of, of 16 individuals asking them what was going on regarding your weight recurrence. Towards the left, the, th the first theme was loss of control and focus. The ch this really, what they they're not giving voice to the graphs I just showed you. The challenges of everyday life, physical and mental health, emotional distress, as well as change in appetite. Towards the right, they're asking, what is it that, what were the benefits 
and what are the important things in uh, having bariatric surgery? And the major theme was reducing the burden of weight management. Also having social support, self-care remained important, and also, I guess, knowing the lasting benefits of surgery. Even though there was a weight recurrence, they still weighed much less than when they started. So how have our therapeutic, um, what are our therapeutic targets uh, knowing this kind of data? A very nice review was fairly recently published. It's a scoping review, again, used thematic structure, tried to, tried to understand what are the factors that lead to weight regain. Well, you see um, uh, the first one, uh, this, which is your second column, dietary non-adherence, behavioral and psychological issues, lack of support and physical inactivity. Um, for me, these are the same as a non-surgical patient. They're, they're no different. And if you look towards the right, they, they go down a little bit deeper, higher calorie intake, increased carbs and alcohol, diet-related behaviors, psychological factors, anxiety, depression, poor follow-up, uh, and low, moderate to vigorous physical activity. Again, these are no different whether you had surgery or not. Uh, and that's probably why up until now, and including tomorrow, uh, our major focus is on, on psycho, behavioral, social um, treatments, because it really kind of deals with these issues. Um, as far as what specific targets we're seeing in treatment, the labs to trial looked at weight change in three years, a huge number of variables. You can't read them, but all those variables are there. And it was interesting that three behaviors explained 16% of the variability in the three year percent weight change. Weekly self-weighing, we talk about that all the time. Stop eating when feeling full, we talk about that all the time. Stop eating continuously during the day, we talk about that all the time. So those are the targets we've been using historically to treat that. And just one more lab study, uh, labs, uh, labs 2 study. This was the looking at characteristics of weight recurrence after 6.6 .6 years. Again, all those numbers in parentheses are the number of variables under those domains. That's a whole lot of variables from this huge data set. And what they found are, again, greater sedentary time, eating more fast food, eating when full, eating continuously. It's the same themes that keep coming up uh, again and again. And that ha those have been the targets for what we've been doing so far to try to combat or mitigate the weight recurrence. So how do we deal with a patient who presented with the rate recurrence. This is my world. You may have different structures. This is the, how my brain operates. Once you make the diagnosis, you can put things in little buckets. You know, towards the left is, is really a surgical route where the, there's a disruption of the surgical line or, or really something has to be done, which requires a revisional procedure. But all the ones, the four of them to the right, are really your entire group, uh, which is a uh, 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 di registered dietitian, health psychologist, uh, physical therapy, exercise physiologist, um, and, and medical management. Um, and you can kind of shoehorn each one uh, into that uh, regarding how we actually treat it. Well, how well, have this, how well have these interventions worked for us? In 2013, uh, there was a systematic review of eight studies looking at behavioral management. Uh, I just put in parentheses in bold the summary statement from the systematic review. Across all studies, patients in the treatment group showed a higher weight loss than patients in the control group. However, differences did not reach significance in any sample, meaning interventions that, that give us these targets. Another review in 2012 uh, looked at psychotherapeutic interventions. Again, I'll just read the conclusion. Both psychotherapeutic interventions and support groups provided a modest benefit effect on post-surgical weight loss, suggesting this is really tough. I mean, the patients tell us what the problem is, but when we give the intervention, it really doesn't seem to change the needle a lot regarding uh, uh, having them uh, get better control of their weight and lose weight once again. Um, I published this with uh, my nurse practitioner who worked with me at the time, Kirsten Sorensen, just a shout out to her. Um, in 2015, so we wanted to look what was new since the previous reviews. So we found seven more randomized controlled trials back in 2015. And as I read this, I, I was kind of brutal when I wrote this, I guess. Currently designed lifestyle interventions either have no effect or are modestly effective in enhancing further weight loss and influencing lifestyle-related behaviors among post-bariatric surgery. I was younger, I guess, so I just kind of threw it all out there. However, current obesity reports published it, um, saying that. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, 
Uh, this was published just, just recently, um, looking at a systematic review and meta-analysis of all of these studies. And again, their conclusion, which is the latest one I'm able to find, our data produced insufficient evidence on whether peri perioperative interventions improve long-term weight-related outcomes. So kind of despite seeing the weight recurrence, knowing what the targets are, at least in my view, looking at the literature in our own, in our own um, uh, clinic, we really have not been greatly successful in helping patients manage their weight once they have a, a recurrence. So that brings me to multimodality therapy that I think is going to be quite helpful. To open up this section, I wanted to start with a diagram from the Obesity Society. You can't read all of it. That's not the point. The, the point, however, is that there are so many determinants of obesity, it's probably not surprising if we target on one thing like slow down your eating. That's going to turn things around when you have you know, dozens and dozens of determinants that contribute to obesity. Everything on the top occurs inside, uh, uh, everything on the left occurs inside the person, meaning, meaning it's biological and so on. Everything to the right is outside the person. Everything on the top is, is affects energy intake. Everything on the bottom affects energy output. And you could look at this, download it yourself from the Obesity Society. And it's not weighted. So you could pick any one of these particular boxes, and it doesn't tell you, is it a minor uh, contributor or a major contributor? And what I have witnessed by being involved in obesity for a long time and looking at this inflection point with medications is I'm going to submit to you that it's the biological aspect that really is going to drive this field forward. And, and I know metabolic surgery is biological, but yet we still see weight recurrence. If you add another powerful biological modality, I think we're going to move the needle on this. And I put highlighted the one that if I was doing, if I was scaling the importance of these determinants, the one that I put a box around would have a very high scaling and the others much less than that. And I'll show you that. Oops, sorry. Oh, th that was intended. So um, th this is my redrawing of the figure that the way my mind works is all roads, not all roads, but if you don't have something that's working, this is the modality that needs to be added, just to kind of follow through with this whole theme, is that anti-obesity medications, I think, uh, is the modality that you want to start thinking about. And I was, not, I was aware that this morning there were two satellite symposia before this on pharmacotherapy. And if any of you have, prescri have prescriptive rights, NPs, PAs, it, I really strongly recommend that you educate yourself on using AOMs and starting to join and add value to your team in addition to everything that you also already do. So I want to spend the last part on the role of pharmacotherapy and introduce you to this. Everything you need to know is not going to be covered in my talk, so I'm going to give you kind of a, a framework on that. There are some guidelines, particularly from Europe, on the role of pharmacotherapy. This uh, guideline came out in 2017. Adding anti-obesity drugs and or redo operations may halt weight regain to create further weight loss when applied at optimal timing. The level of evidence is a three, and the grade of recommendation is a D. And I'm not sure it's gone much higher than that, maybe a little bit higher, which I'll get to towards the end. The uh, latest Canadian obesity guidelines also gave a shout out to pharmacotherapy. Uh, that, that is something that uh, can be uh, thought of to use. So just briefly to introduce the whole idea of pharmacotherapy, we think of the pathophysiology of physiology obesity as an energy balance dysregulation and then organ system impairment. There's many other ways obesity affects health but one of which is an energy balance dysregulation, uh, such that the brain, which kind of organizes your appetite, gets signals from the environment and from uh, different uh, guts, uh, um, from different uh, um, organ systems in the body, like the adipose tissue, pancreas, and gut, and so forth. All these signals come up to the brain, which really determines, am I hungry or not? Should I stop eating or not? We used to think that the adipose tissue was the key organ when leptin was discovered in 1994, and we go, we got it. We, we got the organ and the, and the signal, and we gave leptin to people, and it didn't work much. But what we've now uh, settled on, so far may change later, is it's actually the gut, the organ that 
bariatric surgery works on, particularly the, the, the gut peptides that signal the brain. And by modifying the peptides, the hormones that come from the gut, we really can influence appetite in a significant way. Um, this is, excuse me, this is a diagram uh, that looks at understanding the role of anti-obesity medications. We first only used medications that work directly in the brain because our first understanding is that if we can manipulate things like serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine directly in the brain, we can uh, change the appetite. So the first medications developed target directly aminergic uh, transmission through serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, and we did have modest effects on appetite, but not all that powerful. We are now changing to a peptinergic or a peptide-based treatment by modifying these gut hormones, which are peptides, which then circulate up to the brain and affect appetite. So what is the primary purpose of adjunctive medications to treat obesity? Hopefully all of you will be embracing soon when you start educating yourself about this. First, it impacts the appetite dysregulation of the disease. These medications that we're hearing about today do not cause weight loss by themselves. They cause weight loss by altering appetite. And by altering appetite, individuals are then able to follow a lower calorie diet with more control, more resolve. Therefore, that's what leads to weight loss. So that emphasizes this lifestyle pharmacotherapy interface. To give medication with no other guidance, not knowing what to eat regarding a balanced, healthy diet, uh, they really potentially could suffer from malnutrition and weight loss. They're still, still not going to have appetite, but they're not going to eat healthy. And by doing that, uh, weight loss then improves health. So that's what these medications uh, do. These are the medications currently on the market in the United States. They're not all available around the country. The first medications, like fentramine and, and fentramine topiramate, naltrexone, and bupropion, work directly in the brain. I was mentioning that serotonin, norepinephrine, uh, dopamine, and so on, uh, approved from 1959 all the way to 2014. In 2014, the first uh, GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide-1 uh, mimemic, um, was developed called liraglutide for diabetes, it's Victoza, and then in 2001, which really changed many things, semaglutide was developed for obesity at a lower dose, it's called Ozembic. So the, th these are the drugs when they're approved, and under the effect, and I just want to highlight this again, all the drugs except Orlistat work by appetite regulation. That is the target that these drugs work on. They don't contour body, they don't increase metabolism, they don't burn fat directly. They all work through altering appetite. Uh, and by doing that in a profound way, patients are able to lose weight. I'm, I'm putting all the drugs up here on one slide. Uh, there's no head-to-head -head trials among these. Uh, among, uh, there's one head trial, the rest of them are just up here because I put them on one slide. And what you see in the darker columns is the, the amount of weight loss that individuals lose in a one-year prospective randomized control trial on the drug versus those on placebo. And what you could see uh, is, that, uh, is that most of these, not all, but most of these drugs at least reach close to a 10%, a little less than 10% weight loss threshold, which actually can be helpful, some or less. But in 2000. Uh, one, when semaglutide was uh, commercially released, what you see is the average weight loss really took off. Now you're having 15, 17% weight loss in terzepatide, trade name is Mongero, not approved for weight loss yet, average weight loss is 20%. So I put a dotted line there because those of us in, in my field, uh, medical weight loss, really think we're on this inflection point, a completely different trajectory regarding the direction of obesity care, and we call them second-generation medications, in part because the effectiveness is, is two, two times or more than two times effective than these drugs that worked only in the brain, and also because now we have a delivery of a once-a-week self-administered shot that is very comfortable for patients. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with these drugs. For those of you who, who don't know about GLP-1, uh, it's, an, it's an incretin hormone. Uh, if, you, if you have patients with diabetes, 
They're often on drugs like that, uh, but, and, and it's known mostly to enhance uh, glucose-stimulated um, insulin secretion. Also slows gastric stumping and that, gastric emptying. That's very important for you, right? If you have a patient on a GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist, likely is they're going to have reduced gastric emptying, so that's important for preoperative care and things like that. Um, and uh, these are the drugs towards the lower left, semaglutide, liraglutide, dilaglutide, towards the right are called DPP-4 inhibitors, which, which have natural uh, GLP-1 hang around longer. It turns out that if you give this a DPP-4 inhibitor, it doesn't affect the appetite. You have to give like pharmacologic doses of GLP-1. So it's only those towards the left. The uh, liraglutide and semaglutide in particular at very high doses affects the appetite. So those are the drugs you want to be on. I want to highlight just briefly um, the STEP program, uh, which is the program that was used to investigate high-dose semaglutide because we've learned so much from these trials. And I'm not going to go through all the trials. That's not the purpose of this talk. But rather to in invite you if you want to get in this field, I would strongly encourage you to familiarize yourself with the STEP trial. Everything in purple has been published. So this, the company really designed each of these trials to answer a question like, what is the effect of taking it versus placebo? What's the effect of going off the drug? What is the effect of adding lifestyle management? Uh, what, is the, what is the effect of in children or adolescents? So I just invite you to do it. I'm going to show you data from, I think, one, one of the trials uh, in a moment. I do want to put a circle around this one. This is going to be a game-changing study. It's called the SELECT study. It's going to be read out in August. This is the very first um, uh, randomized controlled cardiovascular outcome trial in patients with obesity who do not, do not have diabetes. As you all know, the only treatment modality we have now that actually improves cardiovascular outcome and improves uh, death rates or reduces death rates is bariatric surgery. We haven't proved that in medicine. Uh, lifestyle, look ahead trial, looked at all these trials, couldn't find it. This is the very first trial of patients who were randomized with obesity at cardiovascular risk without diabetes. And if that proves positive, it really will, I think, be a game changer because you're going to go to a healthcare insurer, I would envision and say this patient is at risk because of their obesity and cardiovascular risk. It has been shown to reduce cardiovascular events. How could you not give this drug? So I'm hoping that will be positive and will be followed by other trials as well. Um, this is the step one trial just to show the magnitude of weight loss. Towards the left, you see the weight loss curves, placebos on the top, and the drug is on the bottom. Average weight loss was 15%. We've, we never saw that before. Towards the right are categorical weight loss um, uh, levels. And what you see is 34%, so about one-third of individuals in this trial lost 20% or more of their body weight. Now, that is encroaching on, not quite there yet, in bariatric surgical territory. However, this is a one-year trial. It's not looking at data 10 and 20 years later. I get that. But the amount of weight loss achieved is starting to close that gap. And if you, if you look at patients on what do they feel when they're on this drug, uh, this is a visual analog scale looking at, um, um, at appetite um, and asking individuals before and after the drug using visual analog scale, what's happening with your hunger? Well, it's less. What's happening with your fullness? I feel more. Uh, I feel full sooner. Satiety, I feel more content. I have less pers uh, prospective food consumption and they have overall less appetite. So everything moves in that right direction. So that's what people, this is looking at statistically, or, or at least methodologically, when I ask a patient when they're on a drug, what do they tell me? They tell me something like, I'm less hungry, I'm more content between meals, I'm full sooner, I have less thoughts of food, and I have less cravings. That is a home run. I mean, patients say, where has this drug been, you know? Um, because that's how they actually feel. So the drug works by changing appetite, and it's the appetite that ch causes a reduction in food intake, and that's how they lose weight, just so that's very, very clear. So where's this field going? This is, frankly, an incomplete table because it changes every single month. I've already told you um, about hormonal treatment, and this is the newest target for pharmaceutical companies. 
Uh, it's not developing more and more drugs that work directly on neurotransmitters in the brain. It's harnessing the effect of gut hormones and making them pharmacologically at higher levels and giving them back to people. It's kind of like diabetes, right? You give patients with diabetes insulin, which is a hormone, back to them to manage their blood sugar. In this case, we give GLP-1 at higher doses back to individuals and really flood those receptors and it changes their appetite. The only drug currently approved on the market is semaglutide, which is trade name is Wagovi. The drug right under it, terzepatide, trade name is Mongero, I'm gonna show you one slide on the data there, is a dual agonist. So it's not only just GLP-1, now it combines it with GIP, both are incretin hormones. That drug is on a fast track for approval for diabetes probably this calendar year. Uh, the, uh, and so what we have is monoagonist, dual agonist, and triagonist. These are all gut and pancreatic hormones, GLP-1, GIP, glucagon, amylin. These are all gut hormones. That bariatric surgery does influence the secretion and absorption of them or the distribution of them, but, but probably not enough or lasting enough. And by adding pharmacotherapy, we could add value. I'm going to hi highlight one more here which is the third one down. It's the, uh, excuse me, it's the fourth one down. GLP-1, GIP, glucagon. It's <laughs> retutrotide. I'm still learning how to pronounce these. Retutrotide. This was just um, re uh, presented at the ADA meeting, which I just came from uh, yesterday. 48-week average weight loss was 24%. In 48 weeks, 20, it's a fourth of your body weight in 48 weeks. Now, that raises all kinds of other issues, right? Body composition, lean body mass, eating disorders, all that kind of stuff. But the, the power of using these GI gut hormones is really just being understood. And the science of these hormones is really changing. So stay tuned. Put your seatbelt on, as they say. This stuff is just really uh, taking off. Um, I just wanted to show you the one data, and I'm coming to an end. This is the only study published so far with terzepatide called Monjero, which is proof for diabetes, in individuals just with obesity. And rather than an average of 15% weight loss, which is semaglutide, here the average weight loss with the highest dose was 20%. And towards the right, you see the trajectories of the weight. Um, and the, late, the longest data we have is two years with semaglutide, and the weight is kept off for two years. So this is putting all the, all the multimodalities on one slide, kind of bring home our, this whole topic. Towards the right, you see a lifestyle alone. It's about a 5 8% weight loss. First-generation medications that work specifically on amines in the brain, it's about a 10% weight loss. And then you flip all the way to the right with bariatric surgery. Now you're talking about, what, 28 32% weight loss. And what we're left with... Is, um, is a treatment gap, but we're filling it now with this new target of gut hormones called second generation medications, and they are moving closer and closer towards bariatric surgery. Let me end up though um, with what, is, what do we know, excuse me, what do we know about the role of these medications for weight recurrence in bariatric surgery? We actually have a fair amount of studies, but they're, they're very preliminary, they're rudimentary, and they're all retrospective. The number of patients vary widely from 33 to 319. The medications used were all on retrospective chart reviews, mostly before these new second generation medications came about. Um, and what you see is outcomes are all over the place. There's no one unified outcome. So I'm not gonna go through each one. It's more the, your understanding that it, the, the data is just emerging. And here's another slide on these data. There's only two prospective studies I'm able to find in the literature. The first one by Jamie Ard, which looked not at weight recurrence, but weight loss. And in fact, they lost more weight with phenamine topiramate. And the last one, Miras, is a prospective study, but in those individuals with obesity, obesity surgery, bariatric surgery, and diabetes. But in short, even though the outcomes are messy, they all lead to weight losses that are likely greater than using the psychotherapeutic uh, behavioral approaches we do more likely be using combination. Just two more slides, two more retrospective chart reviews, but now we're starting to pull out 
the GLP-1 receptor agonists I was just talking about. And this comes from uh, Texas, 207 patients who had, on the average, 40% weight recurrence. That's really quite significant. And they then retrospectively looked at how did these individuals do at 3, 6, 9, and 12 months, those that were on just intensive lifestyle modification, a non-GLP-1 receptor agonist, or a GLP-1 receptor agonist and lifestyle um, ma management. And you could see that it's really those that are on the GLP-1 receptor agonist that lost most amount of body weight. And after a year, they were losing uh, almost, what, 9, 10% of their body weight. And then the same group just recently published um, a more detail looking now just at liraglutide and semaglutide in their patient population. Uh, again, they, they average about a 40% weight rate regain. And what this figure starts with is the weight regain, not from before surgery. It's like they all started weight with the weight recurrence. And what you can see is the semaglutide individuals who took that lost significantly more weight than those on liraglutide. Um, and they actually did really quite well. So we have now retrospective data. What we need now, for those of you who are in research, this is a hot area to really better understand it. So let me, um, let, let me just end up again going back to a patient. This is another patient. Uh, this is someone who had a uh, weight uh, recurrence of 20%. Um, and then this is more of a recent patient who then I started on semaglutide 2.4 milligrams and she ends up here uh, with a total weight loss of 46% by adding medication. So we're not talking about just reversing the weight recurrence in many patients. We're talking about achieving weight losses that actually surpassed what they did at a nadir earlier on. So my takeaways, determinants of post-bariatric surgery weight regain or weight recurrence are largely identical to non-surgical weight regain, with notable except exception of anatomical failure. All patients presenting with weight regain or recurrence should undergo a comprehensive evaluation to assess determinants and intervene as indicated. Even though psychosocial and behavioral management strategies make intuitive sense, current treatments have been inconclusive regarding meaningful improvements. I shouldn't say we shouldn't use it. It's just the outcomes have not been demonstrated. And I think because we're missing an important ingredient, and that's the biology of what's driving those behaviors in the first place. And to treat the biology of those behaviors, you have to use something that works inside the patient, and that to me is pharmacotherapy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kushner, for this enlightening, enlightening uh, discussion, and I think the uh, synergistic effect of metabolic bariatric surgery and pharmacotherapy is definitely the future of many uh, treatment modalities. I have this plaque for you, an appreciation from the ASMBS. Thank you. Thank you.